How many of you here will not remember uh, the structural adjustment programs in the 1980s? How many of you here will not remember the Millennium Development Goals? There were eight when they came about, now they have been renamed, now they are Sustainable Development Goals and there are 34 of them. <laughs> How many of you here will not remember Africa Growth Opportunity Act? The House, the Parliament of the United States of America sitting at the Capitol Hill in the United States of America saying we open the space for African countries and what are they opening space for? Textile. We will now, whether it is in Lesotho, whether it is in Nigeria or Nairobi, Kenya, our women and our young men are suing jeans and other apparel which are taken to supermarkets in the United States of America and once they have worn them and they are tired of them, they created another export opportunity of second-hand clothing. <laughs> and second-hand clothing, that is why the textile industries in Kaduna in Nigeria died. That is why textile companies in Kenya, whether it was, whether it was River Tex, whether it was Kikomi, whether it was Mountex, they all died. Because Europe was now telling us what we have consumed and rejected, you Africans must now consume. And when recently the Rwandese and the Ugandans said that we were going to stop the importation of second-hand clothing, they threatened us with sanction. Africa is meant to treat us new, which that which Europe and America has rejected. That is the Africa that you want me to talk about. So when we talk about this continent of Africa, there have been no shortage of attempts to help her and for her to help herself. I remember on the sixth day of March, 1997, in Accra, Ghana, the former president of Tanzania, Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, speaking under the theme the unity of Africa said, among other things, that we have not come here to remind ourselves how important unity is. We know that African unity is significant. And he said, if Africa is to be a great continent and if Africa is to realize our potential, Africans must de-emphasize their Tanzanianness. Africans must de emphasize their Ghanaianness and they must emphasize their Africanness. And he went on to say, I'm not naive in appreciating that we have long been in our little corners, but I'm telling us that out there in the world, they only know us as Africans. And he reminded the audience that there are times when he has gone to Europe and his own colleagues in the leadership in certain parts of the world will ask him what is happening in Senegal while he himself is the president of Tanzania. <laughs> so that is the Africa that we are talking about. So there have been many initiatives to make Africa great. How many of us will forget the new initiative for African development under NEPAD signed in the year 2001 in Lusaka, Zambia? When Africans took the view once again that in order to grow, we must work together. There have been no shortage of initiatives to bring Africa together. And I remember in the very early days, in the 1960s and in the 1970s, the grand project as conceived by Kwame Nukuruma, having failed to take off as it was designed to take off, many African countries took the view that the only way in which we could ultimately have the Grand African Agenda was to come up with regional development. So we came up with the East African community and indeed I can remember so very vividly because even in Africa there were days when Africa worked in the early days. In the early days many African countries were recording economic growth of anything between 6 and 7 percent. 
In the early days after independence, there were areas where Africa was growing in education. In the health, the indices had improved so that infant mortality and maternal mortality indices were positive. We could see that in agriculture, Africa was beginning to feed herself. Africa was adding value to her things. I remember in Nairobi, in public schools, young school children would receive textbooks and exercise books. I remember that classes had libraries. I remember that in those early days, the public transport systems worked. I remember in those days that our agricultural products were receiving the kind of prices that they ought to receive in the world market. I remember in those early days in countries such as Zambia, the kwacha was strong because the copper was being paid for rightly. I remember in those early days in countries such as this one where cocoa and in the neighboring Cote d'Ivoire when cocoa was being transported and you are receiving the right price. I remember in those early days, diamond from Wadui in Shinyanga and diamond from Botswana and in Namibia were receiving the right price. There was a time in those early days when Africa was indeed moving in some direction. And I remember in East Africa when we had one common currency, when we had one airline, when we had one university and things were moving. In the education sector, I remember students coming from Kenya and traveling to Fura Bay in Freetown. I remember hearing universities such as the University of Education at Winneba. I remember the University of Legon. I remember the University of Nigeria at Nsuka. I remember the University of Maiduguri. And I remember the University of Makerere in Uganda and Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and many other universities. Africa was rising, but something happened. Something happened. Something happened. There are those who think that it was externally induced, they may be right. There are those who think that our leadership was also a contributory factor, and I think they are right. So that there is a sense in which we Africans are also co-authors of our own misfortune. We are co-authors in the sense that there is, and there have been opportunities to make us great. At the beginning of the address, the Vice Chancellor rightly remarked, the, or rather the, the Professor rightly remarked, that in Africa there were countries that were doing better than South Korea. Kenya was doing better than South Korea. Kenya had a higher GDP than China, Ghana the same, Tanzania the same. Then somehow the Koreans went and left us. The Chinese during our lifetime have left us. The Singaporeans have left us. The Malaysians have left us. The Brazilians have left us. The Vietnamese after the war, the war in 1975 have left us. Who is it? What is it that holds us back? What is it? Is it us? Is it some power? Are we children of a lesser God? What is it that holds us back? Why is it that Africa does not work? Why is it that I'm speaking to you now? Even what we call peace in many African countries is not peace, it's just silence. <laughs> I've lamented for too long. Now I want to talk about what it is that we can do. But before I do that, let us look at our continent, at this continent called Africa. Our combined GDP, the 54 officially recognized countries, that is assuming that you don't ask 
uh, the Moroccans about Saharawi. <laughs> Our GDP last year combined, the 54 of us combined, all of us, 1.4 billion of us, our goods and services put together is no more than two trillion United States dollars, and I'm being generous about this. And to give you a perspective, the state of California in the United States of America with a population of slightly under 39 million has a GDP last year of three trillion United States dollars. To give you a perspective, and my good friend, the Honorable Minister from Burundi is here. Their GDP last year was no more than 2.3 billion United States dollars. That is exactly the same amount that the state of New York in New York collects in one day. <laughs> in one day. That is the continent that we are talking about, my mother Africa. How are we going to make her work? I want you to look at her. Look at her in the Gambia. What does she produce? Groundnuts. That is assuming that the Chinese will not come up with plastic groundnuts soon. <laughs> And I'm saying this to tell us we are relying on goods which can be taken out of the market. And tourism. How many people visit the Gambia in the name of tourism? If they are more than one million, then we celebrate and we bring out dancers. Meanwhile, the bazaar market in Istanbul receives 99 million visitors every year. What tourism are we talking about? Let us go to Senegal. What is she producing? How can we make her work? What, how can we make Mauritania work? How can we make Mali work? How can we make Chad work when almost 70% of it has dried out in the last few decades? Then you wonder why we have Boko Haram, why there are recruits for Boko Haram and ISIS and Daesh. Go to Sudan and South Sudan countries that are endowed with natural resources. Go to the Democratic Republic of Congo, a paradox and an irony at once, the richest country on earth in terms of natural resources. But who will allow Congo to be at ease? Who will allow her? Because in her state of confusion, she is a jungle from which you can hunt without consequence. So when one rebel group dies, another one is resuscitated. I know of no African country that makes weapons except South Africa. The others just make bullets. <laughs> the Kenyans will make bullets. The Ugandans will make bullets. But they have no gun to use them and they import the guns. And yet the conflicts that are alive and well in Africa a legion as the Central African Republic, there are conflicts which no longer are no longer covered in the newspapers or in the media of the forgotten conflicts of Africa. Burkina Faso. And yet the African Union says that by the year 2020, the guns will be silent in Africa. 2020 is 28 days away from today. The guns will not be silent. And I'm saying this because to make Africa work, the guns must be silent. Because if the guns are not silent, our farmers will not grow crops. If the guns are not silent, our women will not go to the markets. If the guns are not silent, our resources will not be channeled in the right direction. The guns must be silent. We want to make Africa work. 
Will she walk? Can she walk? Yes, she can. But what are the fundamentals that must make Africa work? Let me remind you, Africa remains attractive. Why is Africa so attractive? Throughout the ages, it has always been attractive. It was attractive to the Portuguese and the Spaniards, but I'm not going to say that. It was attractive to the Arabs, but I'm not going to say that. It was attractive to the Jews, but I will not say that. What I'm going to say that is attractive again. It is so attractive that every two years the Japanese call our leaders to Japan. That is how attractive Africa is. <laughs> they call them to Japan in order to discuss how Japan is going to work with Africa for the benefit of Africa, I do not believe it. <laughs> it must be for the benefit of Japan. It is so attractive that the Chinese leaders call Africans to Beijing every year. The 54 of them, they call them to Beijing. And they say, this is how China is going to work for the benefit of Africa. I refuse to believe them. It must be that there is something that is being done for the benefit of Beijing. Because if I was Chinese, I would do that which is in my best interest, not in the best interest of Africans. It is so attractive that the Russians called our leaders only a few months ago in Sochi. And when they invite you, they invite you to the best places. It is so interesting. So that the Russians can work with Africa for the benefit of Africa. That is how attractive Africa is. It is so attractive that the Germans also invited our leaders to Berlin. It is so attractive that even the Arabs are inviting them to Doha. And it, that is how attractive it is. Have you ever heard the Latin Americans being invited? No, I did not hear. Have you ever heard the Arabs being invited? No. It is only Africans who are invited. That is how attractive Africa is. Is it a bad thing? Depending on what you think. We can use it to our own advantage or we can allow them to use it to their advantage. You know, when I look at Africa and I look at her in the continent, in the context of how attractive she is, another word comes to my mind called globalization. When we talk about globalization, you talk about globalization as if it were a new word. It is not. Africans were once globalized as a commodity in the slave market. We were sold everywhere in the world. That was globalization. <laughs> that was globalization. Then we were globalized again through colonization. Then we were globalized again through neocolonization. Now we are being globalized in the context of opening our markets. It is Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere who in one of his many enlightened moments said, when I hear the Europeans saying that we should open our markets in the name of globalization and they say that the rules are the same, I laugh, Mwalimu said. And he said, it is like a boxing match. The rules are the same. But you don't put a heavyweight boxer and a lightweight boxer and say the rules are the same. <laughs> it is murder. <laughs> Allow me to be melodramatic. You imagine the United States of America with a GDP of anything between 14 trillion and 15 trillion is now entering into a bilateral arrangement with Lesotho, <laughs> whose GDP is two, two billion. And you say, the rules are the same. <laughs> it is a joke. It is murder. Because the revenue that is generated by the 
city of Los Angeles alone in one day is more than the GDP of Lesotho. So we are being told to open our markets and when we opened our market, you saw what happened? Our textile industries died. The large textile industry that we knew about in Kaduna in Nigeria died. Our cotton industries died. Our sugarcane industries died. Our waters, even water nowadays, water, 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 water. Dasani, Coca-Cola gives us water, water. You go to hotels in African countries, the water that we drink has the standardization, not this one, this is from UCC. But this is the exception rather than the rule. This is the exception. The rule is water, Dasani, sitting in Atlanta, Georgia, determining what water we take, we of the middle class. <laughs> Making Africa work is my subject. <laughs> What will, we, what will it take? It will take our combined effort. But there must be an enlightenment of a totally different character. You know, when I think about Africa and I think about her often, And I ask myself, Mother Africa, how will you be a hundred years from today? And I remember the great Sudanese poet, Al Faituri, writing about Africa. He says, oh, Mother Africa, how are you? <laughs> will you be great? You, Mother Africa, where your rebels have gained power and rebuilt, and they have destroyed what they rebuilt. Mother Africa, will you be great? You, Mother Africa, Faituri asks, you the home of great rivers, will your sons ever fish in your rivers? Faituri asks. You, Mother Africa, whose belly is laden with all things known as natural resources, will you ever give meaning to them, Faituri asks. Oh, Mother Africa, are you waiting for God or Mother Africa? I believe that Africa can be made great again. But remember I said, that Africa took the view that she could grow regionally. That is where I went on a tangent. Now I come back. So the East African community was there. South African development community was there. We had Comesa, we had EGAD, we, had, we have ECOWAS, we had Central African Organization. We had the Maghreb, we had the Sahelians. All these attempts have been made, and somehow Africa is still punching below her weight. Let us look at the different sectors so that we are better able to appreciate what Africa can be. And I believe that Africa can be great. I believe that Africa is capable of looking at our agriculture because if a people cannot feed themselves, they cannot be at the dinner table of civilization. Today, Africa cannot feed herself. Here in Ghana, they love rice. They produce a little and import most. <laughs> Here in Ghana, they love ketchup, but I suspect they import some. Here in Ghana, they love chicken. They produce some, but I suspect they import some. In Nigeria, I suspect they love meat, and I suspect they import some. 
they love rice. Here in Ghana, I know they produce cocoa and they love chocolate, but the chocolate they make, they don't like very much. They import chocolate from, from, from Switzerland. So until the day that we begin to like what we produce, so that we add value, I look forward to the day when the greatest chocolate making factories will be here in Ghana and the next will be in Togo and the next in Cote d'Ivoire, it can be done. Which calls into question what are our universities of agriculture doing? Are they involved? Are they included in the agenda of making Africa again? And I'm saying that history has demonstrated that when people decide to work in agriculture, they can actually do something about it. I remember so very vividly in your own Malawi, when President Mbingu Wamutarika took power, he took the view that he could improve agriculture in Malawi. He took the view that he could produce enough maize. He took the view that Malawians could do it, and you will agree with me, they did it. It was done in Malawi, why can it not be done now? I remember so very vividly, those of you who are from Burkina Faso, in 1983 when Thomas Sankara took power, he took the view that the Burkina could feed themselves, and within five years, Burkina Faso could feed herself. It can be done. I know that right now I remember so very vividly in Zimbabwe when President Mugabe took power and even before then during the first five years Mugabe's government was capable of producing enough maize to be consumed in Zimbabwe and enough cotton to make clothes. Today as I speak to you now the Zimbabweans are under threat of starvation. What happened? It can't be done in Zimbabwe and I believe that it must be done if Africa is to work. Africa can work in agriculture. Africa can work in innovation. I'm very glad that in the last one year in Makerere, Uganda, they have come up with a solar-powered bus. Ugandans can do it. I'm very glad that in Nigeria, only last week they unveiled a car that is made out of hydrocarbons. Nigerians can do it. I'm glad that in Morocco now they have the largest uh, solar plant in the world. It can be done. I'm glad that in my own Kenya they now have one of the largest wind farms which generates power. It can be done. I'm glad that during the president of Akufuado, Ghanaians have now abandoned one of the words they used to have in their vocabulary called doom so. I'm glad. <laughs> in other words, if you look very keenly, there are things that can be done. And I'm suggesting to us that in order to do these things, we must ask ourselves how it can be achieved. As I draw to the conclusion of my intervention, I now want to talk of the new threats. How can we make a lot of writing has been done in the recent past about Africa. There are things, there are certain things that Africa must do and there are certain things that Africa must not do. The belief that we can borrow money from multilateral institutions and become rich is misguided. Zambia's Dambisa Moy in a book, Dead Aid, tells us it cannot be done. That is the route not to take. The belief that we will follow a model that is conceived on our behalf by European universities is misguided. I want you to read the book written by a Korean called Ha Jun Chang, The Bad Samaritans, in which he argues that each country must find a model that suits our own circumstances. It can be done. I want you also to remember a book which all of you must have read, written by my own Kenyan friend, Dr. Kalestas Juma, The New Harvest, in which he says that Africans must invent and innovate. I want you to read a book written by Olusha Gunobasanjo and Greg Mills, among others, making Africa work. Africa can be made to work. 
But Africa will only be made to work when she is conscious of our current position. Which brings me to a question that we must now pose. What is the danger of other powers operating in Africa? Do they threaten our being? And I'm now talking about China. China is a very interesting country from which there's a lot of things to learn. But she's also a danger to the continent, if we are not careful. What is there to learn from China? The thing to learn from China is that during our lifetime, the Chinese, through their ingenuity, have succeeded in lifting nearly 800 million people out of poverty. What did the Chinese do? Is there something that we can learn from them? I think there is. Those of you who have the advantage and the privilege of serving in government, ask yourself, what did the Chinese do that within our own lifetime they succeeded in doing that? And they are everywhere, the Chinese. They know what they want. I think the first thing that you must do, you must know what you want. You know, last year I was sitting and watching a Chinese uh, news uh, channel and if you want to understand what others who are potentially your friends and enemies are doing, you must listen to their news. <laughs> I was watching the CGTN and I was listening to the 6,000 delegates in China sitting and thinking about China how China will deal with Africa and the world a hundred years from thence. The people who are there will not be alive. In many African countries, if you tell them to think about what will happen tomorrow, they say only God knows. No. <laughs> I hold the view that when you are planning, you plan as if you will never die. And if you are prayerful, you pray as if you'll die the next minute. <laughs> I'm suggesting that the Chinese have given us away. Today, the Chinese, and see how the Chinese are working with us. Which university in Africa, what its name does not have a Confucius center? I do not know whether you have one here at UCC. <laughs> the Chinese have a Confucius center because the mind is the standard of the man. Once you influence the mind, you can sit pretty because you can predict what the mind will do. How many of you who are the middle class today, in addition to asking your children to read French and Germany, are now asking and encouraging their children, go ye and learn Mandarin? How many of you? Confucius Center to work on your mind. On our mind. And then, how many countries in Africa don't you find a stadium built by Chinese? And if it is not a stadium, it is your state house. <laughs> and if it is not the state house, it's the African headquarters. And if it is not the African headquarters, it's infrastructure, it's the road or the railway. And if it is not the railway, it is the four lorries. And if it is not those, in the next ten years, out of every 10 phones used by you will be Chinese. If it is not Techno, it is Infinix. If it is not Infinix, it is Huawei. No African country produces a phone. None. It is only Rwanda that is beginning to assemble some. There is something to admire about the Chinese. But if we want to benefit the, from the Chinese, we must be strong. We must be weak, we must not be weak, we must negotiate continentally. The Koreans are also small but strong. But if we are not careful, and I'm saying this, if we are not careful, in the next 25 years, 
all of us will be speaking Mandarin. If we are not careful, if we are not careful, because the Chinese here are not here for charity, the Chinese are here to do business. And in the world of business, it is a cruel world where throats are literally cut. I'm reading a small book written by a young Chinese girl called Irene Yuan Sun, the next factory of the world. And the young Chinese girl is saying exactly what I'm saying. He says that Africa can benefit from China. Africa can be the next factory of the world. But it's not just going to happen. Something must be done about it, which is what brings me to the last segment of my conversation, Africa Agenda 2063. I remember on that day in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, Nkosazana and Lamini Zuma, the then chairman of the organization of, African, of the African Union, writing and reading an imaginary letter to Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma. I will not remember the words exactly, but I'll remember it in substance. And in substance, he will say, by the year 2063, we Africans having recognized that we may have lost the last 50 years of our independence, will not lose the next 50 years of our independence. I'm adding a few things in order to make it relevant. But she was saying, in effect, the Osagie for in the year 2063, Africa will be different. There'll be an electric rail running from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Dakar in Senegal. In the year 2063, Africa will be feeding herself, and the breadbasket of Africa will be Zimbabwe in Southern Africa and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa will be making her own furniture and we will do so in a sustainable manner with the equatorial forests of Congo being the source of our products. I will remember in those, in those years to come, what you now see as the Sahara Desert will have been greened. Africa will be covered in forests. The Democratic Republic of Congo will become the equivalent of the Silicon Valley. There will be rare earth. Africa will use phones made by Africans. Africa will refine their own oil. Africa will use our own copper. Africa will have excess electricity. Africa will have the Inga Dam in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Africa will have built the Grand Renaissance Dam. And indeed, at that time, Sudan will not quarrel with Ethiopia, and Egypt will not quarrel with Ethiopia. They will be using these resources well. Africa will not be importing fish, tilapia, from China. The fish will be produced in Lake Victoria, Lake Tanganyika, Lake Tana, and all these other places. That was the reason of Africa Agenda 2063. It was a dream. But is it not true that we must all dream? We must dream. The only thing that we must do once we have dreamt, we must wake up. The problem is sometimes we dream and we don't wake up. We must wake up and now begin to implement. Do I think that Africa woke up? I think Africa woke up. And that is how I understand the Africa continental free trade area. The Africa continental free trade area is a demonstration that beyond dreaming in a very amorphous manner, we now want to give form and character to our dream by operationalization so that we begin to bring down the tariff and non-tariff barriers so that we are able to ensure that Africa will do things that will make Africa great. Intra-African trade will be 80%. And that is why it gladdens my heart that Accra, Ghana was chosen to be the secretariat of the ACTF. I look forward to the day when the protocols are now being made that we shall begin to take advantage of innovation. You remember Africa lost out in the industrial, first industrial revolution. Africa lost out in the second industrial revolution. Africa has started gaining a little from the third industrial revolution. 
We are now in the fourth industrial revolution where we are talking about artificial intelligence, we are talking about robotics, we are talking about the Internet of Things. We are saying that Africa must now find her pride of place in those areas so that Africa can be great in agriculture. Africa can be great in education. Africa can be great in value addition. Africa can be great in utilizing our fossil fuels so that young Africans will not cross the Mediterranean Sea. When I look at Africa, I think that she can be made to work. But the last thing that we must do is to ensure that we introduce hygiene in our politics. Because it all begins and ends with leadership. History has demonstrated, not once, not twice, but times without number, that when you have men and women who are good leaders and they know what they want, they can catapult their countries within a short time into the higher orbits of development. We must now begin to ask ourselves, how do we govern ourselves? How do we create a political environment where all these things can happen? I'm suggesting to us without being arrogant and speaking hopefully with the humility that will not sharpen the anger of leaders in this forum, but will open their eyes. When you are in a position of honor and privilege, remember that your duty is to serve. Those of you who are cabinet ministers, remember that you are not necessarily the best of men but you've been favored to be in positions of honor and privilege. <coughs> you are not necessarily the best of women. Because you have been honored and privileged, serve in humility. And the problem in Africa is that many African leaders suffer from what I call the Jehovah complex. The Jehovah complex is a belief by those in leadership that they have the monopoly of wisdom and they have the monopoly of knowledge. That is not the root. Africa will be great when her leaders begin to know that they have a duty to serve so that the future generation will be able to make Africa great again. Africa can be great. Africa will be great. Africa will be great in agriculture. Africa will be great in our industries. Africa will be great in our education. Africa will be great in all other things, but the last thing that Africans must do is to decolonize our minds. We must liberate ourselves from this misguided view that we cannot achieve. We can achieve, we have achieved, and going forward, working together, we will achieve. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. My advice to all is that we must appreciate everybody so that nobody is left behind in the scheme of things. And I said yesterday that there are three T's that should guide us. And one is thankfulness, to appreciate the work everybody does. The farmers, we have to appreciate them. Cleaners, people who are removing our Fika Mata, people who are sweeping the streets, people who are providing health service, everybody is important. And we must acknowledge this and thank them. The second is truthfulness. We must have a sense of integrity. It's very important. Without that, we can't make any progress. Africa must have a sense of integrity so that we speak the truth and do truthful things so that we can be trusted. And the last one is teamwork. And it, it's based on unity. We all have to unite and work together. And I will end by saying that if we don't work together and we behave like Kwekwa Nancy, then we have a problem. And as he was carrying all the wisdom in his head, on his stomach, and as he was climbing the tree, his son in Tukuma saw him and said, Father, you have, why are you carrying the thing on your stomach to climb the tree? And he remembered that he has forgotten some of the wisdom on the planet. So he decided to come down. And the pot got broken. And that is why we all have some of uh, these wisdom. My prayer is that this continent will grow, will be strong, and work hard, work hard with discipline.
discipline, integrity, and this continent will be great and greater again. Thank you very much. I must tell you that uh, I really benefited from your lively uh, speech and the history that is so well best and well placed. I come from a university. The university is actually a name historically, uh, is the name of a hero who actually struggled trying to liberate South Sudan from all thoughts of issues. He is actually a Pan African person. But one important point that made me to be so excited is the idea of liberation of our minds, our mindset as Africans, our mindset as those who are actually taught by the British or by another colonial administration. And that is the major problem. I do agree with you. That is the major problem. As African, we can do. As Africans, we can make this continent great. And this forum of African universities focusing on agriculture, I think, is a step forward of how we can create a situation in which Africa can make Africa great again. I'm saying this, I would like to borrow a speech of, not a speech really, some words of a minister addressing the forum before that African universities should not only make research, analyze, and live in there, should make research, analyze research, and also create goods and services. That is now you are creating an avenue of employment, making the universities doing things by themselves because the universities, they have to jump in and to demonstrate how Africa can make things and can make things best for the development of Africa. Thank you very much. Let me start by thanking my colleagues who have, in their responses, drawn my attention to certain very critical issues. Let me also thank those who have made comments and posed certain very pointed questions. In the last four years, I've had the privilege of visiting most African countries. And sometimes I ask myself, is it worth it? Sometimes I ask the question, is my voice and others like mine voices in the wilderness? But then I'm energized, particularly by the young Africans that I meet across the continent. whether it is in Monrovia, in Liberia, or Freetown in Sierra Leone, or in Kampala, Uganda, or in Windhoek in Namibia, and you get the feeling that they want to do it. In my younger days, I used to be a little impatient, <laughs> taking the view that everything must happen in my lifetime. I no longer think like that. I now hold the view is that you can only play your role. And once you've played your role, the others will play their role. And perhaps it is our children and children's children who will realize and see the fruits of this dream. I see some of our Chinese friends here, and I want to talk to you very positively. Today, when we talk about China, and when the Chinese talk about China, 
and the opening of China, they remember a man called Deng Xiaoping. I'm sure if Deng Xiaoping were to wake up today, he would be shocked at what has happened in China. I want us to think long term so that the things we do must not happen just in our lifetime. And if you hold that view, you will not be disappointed. If you think that everything must happen now, then you will be disappointed. I do not think that we ought to be disappointed. I also agree with you when you say that these things we say here, are we preaching to the converted? Are we saying anything new? I suspect not. The things that we are saying here and now, some better minds have actually thought about them. There is a book I was reading by a South African who has written a book, Why Africa is Poor and What They Can Do About It, Greg Mills. And he has thought about it and has major prescriptions. And when you talk about my good friend who talked about the gender question, sometimes we don't talk about it as directly as you would want us to. But we are conscious, 52% of the African population are women. Last night when we were driving from Accra to Cape Coast, it was not lost on me that 90% of the street vendors were women and young girls. Working at nine, up to nine in the night. It is not that Africans don't work hard. They work hard at nine and then they will be awake. The only thing is that we don't work smart. So I have no doubt in my mind that going forward, what we are doing here must have and make meaning to people in rural Africa. And there is something to learn also from India. India went into cottage industries. And one of the things that I was reading in the book that I've referred to as the next factory of the world, look at the area of pharmaceuticals. Today we have uh, trials of vaccines of Ebola in the Democratic Republic of Congo and vaccines of HIV, AIDS, which are being tried by pharmaceutical companies from the United States of America and Germany. And I was reading that China has over 6,675 pharmaceutical factories. Germany with a population of 81 million, has 920 pharmaceutical companies. Nigeria, with a population of 250 plus, has only eight pharmaceutical companies. If you look at the area of electricity generation, Iran generates 70,000 megawatts of electricity. That is more than the entire sub-Saharan Africa, excluding South Africa. We cannot industrialize, I agree with you, without research and development. But many universities find themselves in a very sorry situation. The Honorable the Vice Chancellor and the Vice Chancellors here will remember in Lagos in 1980, it was decided that every African company would dedicate 1% of their annual budget to research and development. Today, which African country does that? Perhaps only South Africa does that. The rest of the public universities in many African countries can barely pay statutory deduction for staff salaries. I'm saying that universities must also find a way, easier said than done, I am aware, easier said than done, of having a connection between the universities and things happening in the villages. Before we came here, we passed through the exhibition center. And I saw the exhibits from the University of Gulu in Uganda. The honey that is being produced, the groundnuts that are being produced. I went to another university also from Uganda where the students are coming up with, uh, with certain rudimentary equipment. Professor Mabel Imbuga was the Vice Chancellor of Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology in my own country in Kenya. 
They were, I went to their university at one time, they were producing juice and other things. But how do we upscale that so that we can have the numbers? And many other universities. The other thing that I think is very important going forward is that we must ask ourselves, today, Europe and America are in the arena of making hybrid cars, electricity cars. Some, for some reason, it is at this time when Europe and America are discovering this thing that every other African country is discovering oil. One may think rather late in the day. Uganda will start production in 2023. Kenya will start proper production in the year 2023, I think. I think we have natural gas. What are we going to do in order to make sure that fossil fuel remains relevant in this scheme of things? Because we may be holding the short hand of the stick. If you look at many Arab countries, you see the Saudi Arabia, you see the Kuwaitis, you see the Qataris, the Bahrainians, the Brunei, they are beginning to divest out of oil. What are we going to do? Are we going to be told by Total and Shell and Elf that all these gas stations must now have chargers instead of petroleum? These are things that I think we must look at going forward. And the young man who posed the question, what do we do with our politics? You know, governance is very critical. And, and I, there is some ideas are invading my mind lately. And they are very dangerous ideas. <laughs> I even fear them myself, these ideas that I have. Because I have examined Africa since 1992. And what I've discovered is that we are running something called democracy. That democracy is defined to us by the West. And the West tells us that democracy means multi-party politics. Democracy means one man, one vote. I have no quarrel with that. Democracy means terms for president. Democracy means a vibrant press. Democracy means a vibrant civil society defined by the West. And in many African countries, after this election, there is disorder. I'm now beginning to ask myself, is this democracy defined by the West a danger to Africa? I'm not saying, I've not quarreled with democracy. But shouldn't we define it? Shouldn't we define our own governance systems that deal with our realities? I have no answer, but shouldn't we? And I'm saying that time has come that we must begin to think about this. Because look, my good friend in Malawi will tell you, my good friend from Kenya will tell you, from Burundi will tell you, from South Sudan will tell you, there is a sense in which when we African politicians go to elections, we go into the elections on the basis that I must win. If I don't win, the elections are in. And I'll not accept the elections. So how do we deal with that? Because I think if we don't have sound governance system, all the beautiful things that we are doing will be undermined by the chaos and the mayhem that comes about every so often. And I'm saying that there is wisdom in beginning to think about. This is why I understand the Chinese have been very slow in embracing this thing. They are opening the space very slowly very slowly, it's very slowly. They are picking up people into the middle class, people have a stake, so that when they vote, they vote sensibly. Perhaps there is something to learn about that going forward. The last question that has been asked and which I want to respond to, when I walk across Africa, do I see good things? I see. I see good things. Others may not agree with me, and I don't expect them to agree with me all the time. But I can pick a few countries. I can pick Rwanda. People have a problem with sometimes with Rwanda. But why do I pick Rwanda? In 1994, the obituary of Rwanda was written. They said that this, in fact, it was a fulfillment of some prediction that these people can't govern themselves 
in my lifetime. I've gone to Rwanda and I've seen what they have done in the healthcare system. I've seen what they have done with infrastructure. I've seen what they are doing in agriculture. I've seen how they are dealing with the question of women in governance. I've seen how they are dealing with rural poverty through the production of uh, goods and services. And I'm convinced that if they continue on that trajectory for the next 50 years, we'll be talking about another Singapore. I have gone to Ethiopia in the recent past. And I've seen Ethiopia. And I've seen that Ethiopia has, is doing certain things well. Look at the Ethiopians did have their problems during the Deg regime. Ethiopian airline is the only profit-making airline in Africa. No, no other airline makes profit. <laughs> they have succeeded in running their airline in a profitable way. And I saw when the new prime minister came, he came and there was a conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea, and very quickly they resolved. My only problem with the Nobel Prize for anything, I think that the Eritrean president should also have been named as a co-winner of the Nobel Prize. Because it takes two to tango. But that notwithstanding, I saw Ethiopia in 1984 when Ethiopia was in a civil war. In my own lifetime, Ethiopia is now going to generate nearly 10,000 megawatts of electricity. I've seen a good thing happening in Ethiopia. I've seen other things. I've seen in Botswana. Botswana recently had a very successful, somehow the Botswana know how to hold an election and how to accept defeat. I must commend them. Even the Namibians know how to hold an election. Because they held an election, the president won, and nobody is saying that he's rigged. So you can see that the Botswana have leveraged. Botswana is the only African country in the recent past that has had a budget surplus. I see good things in Botswana. I, I, I think that Namibia, good things, but there is the residual question of land, which is the last colonial question, and you've got to deal with it at a certain stage. So one can go on and on. Even in my, every African country that you go to, all of them, almost without exception, and I need not name any one of them, the consciousness that the people are at the heart of development is there. Whether you go to Kenya, whether you go to Tanzania, whether you go even to South Sudan, maybe troubled for the moment, but the consciousness of the leaders, the consciousness of the leaders that without the people and without doing certain things, you cannot go far. Burundi, I was having a conversation with the professor who is, who is a minister here. For the first time, the Burundians are going to hold an election which they will fund. They will finance from their own resources. Good thing. Here in Ghana, your own president came up with the whole idea of, is it 200 uh, industries in all the, the districts? There are 291 of them. There is a sense in which you may not agree because the problem is if you are in a country, uh, you normally see only the negative things, not the positive. It takes a visitor to remind you that there are certain good things that are happening. So even here in Ghana, there are certain things good that are happening. I'm not talking about your new notes. That is, uh, that is not necessarily good. <laughs> but, but I'm talking about, you know, when, when as I conclude, Yesterday, when, 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 I, when I saw President Akufuado saying that uh, he has abandoned the referendum, I was very happy. Why? Because he listened to the people. When leaders begin to listen, that is the beginning of progress. So I can confirm to the young man and woman who spoke that ultimately it is us. And Professor, I want to conclude with what you are saying. And the young man, the young woman who talked about language. You know, this thing of language is very interesting. The African Union has already adopted Kiswahili as the lingua franca. And I look forward in about uh, 10 years when we will be addressing this fora in Kiswahili. But Chinua Achebe of Nigeria at one time addressed the English language in a very interesting way. He said, the British may have stolen many things from us, but we also stole something from them, their language. And we have now appropriated it and Africanized it, and we can use it to good effect. 
So there is a sense in which I personally, even as I talk about African languages, they must be given their pride of place. The ability to speak many languages is also an advantage. And I think there is an advantage that we must use to good effect, but remain faithful to our culture. Many things can be said, and many things have been said, but you young generation, if Africa is to be great, it is on your shoulders. You ask the question, you are only successful when your successor succeeds. When you are looking at things in a historical context, you don't pass judgment after 50 years. You pass judgment after 100 years. So we are still in early days yet. And I think the fact that Kwame Nkrumah, you Ghanaians will remember that after 1966, Kwame Nkrumah, even his works were banned, his books and speeches could not be printed in this country until 1972. And in the selection of speeches which reintroduced Nkrumah to Ghana is Ignatius Kutua Chempong, who has written the forward. It means that sometimes it takes time to recognize prophets. So, he was right, he will be right, he was ahead of his time, and when you are ahead of your time, what society normally does is to send you to the grave sooner rather than later, then to begin to admire you from the grave. Thank you very much.